Well, hi again, everybody. My name is Greg Anderson, and this is the Good Timekeeping Show with Greg Anderson. Hey, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of my own personal history when it comes to watches. So um, thanks to eBay, I was able to fill in some of the gaps in my personal watch history. Let me tell you about it. When I was probably about eight years old, I learned how to tell time. And remember, this is the early 1970s. So analog clocks and watches were the thing. Digital clocks and watches really didn't take hold until the late 1970s, and when they did, boy, they really did. But before that, it was all analog. So I remember I learned how to tell time, and I think I was just maybe a, a few months earlier than some of my, my peers as far as the timing on when I learned to tell time. And then I was really good at it, and we, we had a little section in our, our grade school where we would you know, get tested on telling time and stuff. I was really good at it. And so I wanted my own watch. And so uh, my parents got me a watch and it looked just like this one. This is a Timex Mercury watch. And this particular watch was available in uh, some, a few different colors and also the font for the, for the numbers. Uh, there was a little bit of variation depending on which one you bought. But uh, this, is, this is the one just like my parents bought me. Now I should tell you. Um, when we, this was in the Chicago area, right? So when we moved away from the Chicago area a few years later, um, let's just say not everything made it all the way across country to our new home. So we have our theories about why that happened and maybe some, uh, you know, maybe some of the people involved in the move were not quite as uh, upstanding as we would have, we would have liked. So. Um, the watch I had was lost somewhere a few years after I got it, never to be seen again, until, until I found eBay. So uh, this was just recently, I started looking around because I was trying to figure out, well, what, what was the model of that watch? So I kind of started typing in, you know, search terms, Timex, early 70s watch, wind up watch, all these things. And so that's when I found out uh, what this was and I found some pictures various people had watches that to me looked just like the watch that I had when I was a kid. And as a matter of fact, I found this one on eBay and I purchased it from a guy in the Chicago area. And if I look at the map, uh, where this came from <laughs> was maybe about a half hour drive away from where we used to live in the Chicago area. So uh, a part of me thinks, uh, what, are the, what are the odds? <laughs> that this is actually the same exact watch, that it never left the Chicago area. Somebody found it and they had it serviced and now it works because one of the things that happened uh, with this watch is it stopped working after a, about a year or so. Um, I know the slogan for Timex is it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. Mine stopped ticking and I think one of the problems was that I probably wound it too often just, you know, when I was just nothing to do sitting in class bored, you know, I might have just decided to wind it up. I think I just wound it too tight most of the time and, and after a while it just didn't work any, anymore. It just wouldn't run. So uh, I had this sense even as a young kid that even though, yeah, Timex takes a licking and keeps on ticking, maybe certain Timex watches were... Uh, uh, higher quality than others and maybe the one I had wasn't the highest of quality but uh, so it stopped working that's why I stopped using it that's why it sat in a drawer for a while until somewhere years later I think in that move away from Chicago it disappeared but what are the chances that this <laughs> this is the same one it never left Chicago someone had it serviced and then uh, I found it on eBay it's the same thing now this is a, a new watch band but whoever did this actually um, got a got a watch band that looks uh, amazingly similar to the original watch band of, of this watch. One of those things where back in Chicago, you might say, um, every now and then someone might say, uh, uh, listen, a favor was done on your behalf. Uh, that is all you need to know. You must ask no questions. Have a nice day. So maybe, maybe that watch that was lost so years ago, someone did a favor for me and eventually it ended up on eBay fixed and ready for me to have once again. I don't know. Anyway, but that, anyway, that's my first watch. And after, like I say, about a year, it didn't work anymore. So, uh, but by then I was really interested in making sure I had a waterproof watch. Okay, so uh, my folks got me this one and this is a diver's style watch. It, it originally came with a diver's style 
in a watch band. But uh, I don't know, after a year or so, uh, I think my friend Steve had a, a nice fancy leather strap like this. And so I wanted one. So I uh, eventually moved my, my watch from its original diver style watch band to this leather strap. But this is the same watch. This one never got lost. I, I had it sitting in a in a, in a box for a long time, but I found this just the other day and it, it well, the second hand still works, but the rest of it, uh, the hands don't move. But that's okay. I don't have to have it fixed. This is still, you know, my, my watch. It does, it belongs in my personal museum. And again, I like this because again, it's a wind up watch. Uh, I don't think I overwound it, but it was waterproof. And that was cool for a kid to have this diver style watch that was a waterproof and uh, well, not much to say about that, except that after having this for a couple years, I got interested in digital watches and this was a new thing. Now, for most folks in the 1970s, the first time they saw a digital watch was probably in the movie Live and Let Die, where Roger Moore, James Bond had, had one, he goes to check the time and there's a close up on his watch. And that was a Hamilton Pulsar uh, digital watch and everyone went nuts for this cool thing, this digital watch. Now, the, the thing about it, however, is that uh, I was still pretty young. I, I wasn't watching James Bond movies a, as a kid, but one show I did watch as a kid where I saw that same digital watch on someone's wrist was The Magician starring Bill Bixby. This was a, a you know, kind of a, a private eye detective sort of, of TV series that uh, went on the air in 1974. And we, we, we just loved this show. Uh, and for me, just it, it was perfect timing because as a young kid, a, again, a guy who's a magician, oh, I wanted to watch that show, but it was even better than that because not only was he in the, in the, in the show, he was this famous, rich, very successful stage magician, but he had all the cool gadgets rivaling James Bond. And I, what do I know about James Bond? James Bond was a naughty person who did bad things, right? But the magician, he was cool. He helped people that were in trouble. This was years before the A-Team. If you needed help and you had nowhere else to turn, you went to the magician to solve your problems. And see, the, the story was that, uh, you know, in the pilot episode, they established that uh, years earlier, he was wrongly imprisoned, uh, kind of like the A-Team years before the A-Team was invented. He was wrongly imprisoned in South America. We don't know which country. He escaped. And uh, I, I guess that's maybe when he first became a great escape artist, right? One of his fellow uh, inmates that also escaped with him, he, he assisted this other guy in escaping, left him a large sum of money so not only was he rich from being uh, a very successful stage magician, but also because this guy left him this ton of money and he had a soft spot for those that were in real need of help. So what are the cool gadgets this guy had in addition to his amazing, you know, abilities as an escape artist and his, his wit, his, his ability to, uh, outsmart the bad guys every time and use uh, little, little concepts and principles from his magic act to always, you know, get out of tough situations and distract the bad guys and, and all that stuff. Um, he had these gadgets. Okay, so number one, you know, he drove a white Corvette. In the pilot episode, it was a 73 Corvette. And in the regular series, it was a 74 Corvette. Even as a young kid, I could see the difference uh, between, between those two cars. In his Corvette, he had a phone a phone in the car in the 1970s. This was a big deal. Not only that, he lived in an airplane. Okay. So, and the airplane had a ramp on the back so he could, that they could lower the ramp. He could drive his Corvette right up into the plane, close that ramp and, and fly away and go wherever he wanted to go with his best friend pilot that uh, also lived in the plane and, and would fly him around anywhere. So uh, he had, you know, in, in, in his spare time, because he's so successful and rich and could do whatever he wanted to, he helped people that needed help doing kind of the, the whole private eye gig. Well. As I'm watching this, and, and really, I, I remember almost none of the plot lines of these episodes uh, now that I kind of review these today. And again, the series is available on DVD. So if you want to get it, uh, it's from uh, VEI.TV. So you can look that up. It's a Canadian company. You can get the entire series. It only lasted one season. Uh, so there was one episode in particular, and I only remembered this one moment from when I was a kid, because this was a big deal. In this moment, 
the bad guys are going to call a phone booth, a payphone, at, at 11 o'clock. Okay, so Bill Bixby, the magician, drives his Corvette, comes, comes and pulls into this little parking lot where there's the, the phone booth there, gets out of the car and has just enough time to check his watch. And it was the, the digital watch. And they got a close up on the watch face as he pushes the button to see what time it is, just as it turns from 1059 to 11 o'clock. And then one moment later, the phone rings at the phone booth. The bad guys have called in to, uh, you know, arrange for a ransom or, or whatever like that. So, uh, so I saw the digital watch on TV and I'm like, what is that? I gotta have one of those. Well, <laughs> I soon found out that they were super expensive at the time. Uh, later, I found out that th that watch that was featured in the series was Bill Bixby, the actor, his personal watch that he wore. And if you watch the series, um, he's wearing that watch in just almost every scene. Anytime you see his wrist, he's got that watch on. Um, they, they only featured it that one time where you actually saw what it does. The rest of the time, it's just, you know, the, the screen is blank and you can see uh, that, but that he's wearing it. And, uh, and that was the deal with those original digital watches that were LED. Okay, most of the time the screen was blank, but you had to press a button to light up the time and it would come on just for a couple seconds. Press it again for the date or the, the seconds display. But then again, it would only stay on for a couple seconds and then turn off. Uh, and I guess that was, you know, to save battery life. This was still kind of new technology at the time. Now here's a watch. This is not an authentic watch from the era, but this one operates almost the same way as the ones from the 1970s. So you can, you can buy these for cheap. I don't know how, how well they're going to last, but if you want to have the feel of having a 1970s LED digital watch, this one is about the closest you're going to get uh, just walking into your local Walmart store and picking up a new watch that uh, that acts like an old watch. But, uh, you know, my friends and I, my peers, we just we saw these digital watches and we thought, oh, this is great. I would love to have a digital watch with little light up red LEDs. I, I got to have one of those. And we found out it was very expensive. So when when James Bond was wearing it and when Bill Bixby was wearing it, they were probably, I don't know, uh, over a thousand dollars. I don't remember the exact price, right? But it was it's expensive, especially for 1970s dollars, right? By the time I actually saw one in a store not far from my house in the Chicago area, it was about two hundred dollars, which was still, you know, 1970s dollars. That was a big deal for a little kid to say, I want that two hundred dollar watch, right? However, <laughs> Bunch of companies got into the market, maybe that that had started, you know, little startups that were making computer stuff, and and uh, and they got into the LEDs, and they and they started to mass produce these things until the price went way, 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 way down. And so companies like Texas Instruments and National Semiconductor started making these digital watches, and uh, and it got down to you know by by say 1977 or so, uh, maybe twenty dollars for a decent looking digital watch that was LED. And so all of a sudden. Kids were, kids were getting them and kids in my junior high would have digital watches. Most of them with the, with the plastic resin case, you know, so I didn't think that looked very good. I thought, oh, it's a cheap little plastic watch. I wanted something kind of metal. And I, and I really wanted this digital watch. The, the kid next door had one. I was really jealous. I thought, I want, I want a watch just like his. Right? Can, can we get one of those? And uh, it, didn't, it didn't happen for a while. But okay, <laughs> that's my roundabout way to get to my first digital watch. And it looked kind of like this. This was another one that the original watch I had, and I think I got it for my birthday in the fall of 1977. Uh, th this was this was kind of a gold tone watch with a with a brown leather watch band. And uh, the other part of the face here that wasn't metallic was a uh, brown tint on that. Um, I wanted the LED digital watch. But, and this was what, just like a couple weeks after I saw Star Wars for the first time, uh, my parents got me a digital watch and it was LCD. And I don't think I'd actually seen LCD watches in person before they gave me one. And at first I thought, eh, it's not LED. But then I quickly realized, hey, wait a second. You don't have to press a button. It shows the time all the time uh, without pressing a button. If you press a button, then it goes to the, uh, the, the date and you press it again and it goes to the seconds. Um, but yeah, I can just look at it whenever and not press the button and, and see the time. So I thought, oh, okay, LCD, that's cool. Now the development of LCD technology at first 
uh, it wasn't as stable as it became uh, later. And so some of the original LCD stuff, you know, it kind of got cloudy and kind of got weird. But uh, by, by the late 70s, they had stabilized the uh, technology to the point where even this authentic watch from the era still has a decent looking LCD uh, display, the, the, you know, the digital readout on, on LCD. So um, again, my original gold tone watch uh, I, I replaced the watch band with a Twistoflex watch band from Spidel. So if you don't know what Twistoflex is, they still sell those for brand new. I might just buy a Twistoflex watch band and stick it on here just, just for nostalgia. Uh, but my, my original one with the Twistoflex watch band got lost somewhere down the line, maybe when we moved away from Chicago, I don't know. So I didn't have it for, for the longest time. And so then I found this one, again, thanks to eBay. This, this actually came from someone in England and uh, it's, it's in pretty good shape. Looks like it really hasn't been used uh, and, it, and it still works. So I, I gobbled this one up. And now in, in a sense, I've filled in the gaps in my collection by having, you know, the Timex Mercury watch, this watch that was never missing except sitting in a box somewhere. And then this one that, that uh, is, is not a perfect replica, but is, is effectively the same watch in a different color as the one I had way back in uh, the 1970s. And so after those watches, so this one from about 1977, I used it for, um, I used the one I had for a couple of years. And then kind of, as I get into high school, I wasn't really wearing a watch every day uh, and then, so it wasn't until, you know, around 1983 or 84 when I got this one. Uh, and, and from then on, I've taken very good care and kept track of my watches. So there's nothing missing from 1983 onward as far as my watch collection goes. But again, thanks to eBay, I had to, to fill in those gaps. And now I feel like my life is complete. And now you know what it was like to be a kid in the 70s trying to find your way in the watch world. But uh, well, here we are. So anyway, thank you for <laughs> a little bit of indulgence there. This is my, my personal history and uh, it gives you a little bit of background. I, I think maybe some of you might be about the same age I am and you might remember some of the uh, transitions we had in the 1970s from an analog world to a digital world and uh, things have never been the same ever since then. All right, well, that's all for now. Thank you for indulging me for just a few minutes. And uh, well, obviously I have some more ideas for some more videos coming up soon. So I hope you will join me in another soon to be released episode of The Good Timekeeping Show.